Allison, you want to give us a sound check, please? Hello. Perfect. You're you okay? Yourself. I should mute myself? Yep. Okay. Hi, Seth. We sent you an audio pin. You can use that to mute and unmute yourself. Now he's been quiet. Sound check. Sound check. We chair, chair. Friendly. We hear you loud and clear. Awesome. I just saw a notice up here that was uh, telling me no audio, so I was going to be a little bit concerned, but it sounds like it's uh, working as it should. Sounds good. So I do have a question. Go ahead. How do I pronounce David's last name? Tedrow? Yes. I was just as it's, as it's David. Yes, Tedrow is yes. Perfect. And if I uh, recall from my notes, I, in between the times that I should be speaking. I will self mute. Yes. Is that correct? You, um, I've added you, and you'll be saying that in the attendees tab will be the board members for the other Twig members, and they will have the ability to use their hand. Perfect.
And did you say that you can hear me uh, hear me well? Because I've got my surface closed, and I just want to make sure that my microphone is transmitting in an OK volume. Loud and clear. Awesome. That's good to know. Jeff Murphy has his hand. Yeah, I can't. I have a problem. I can't. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. It says I'm muted, so I don't know. Yeah, so you will remain muted until you raise your hand, and then the chair will call on you. Ah, thank you. No worries. Thank you. Oh, there we are. Seth, can you give us a sound check? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Thank you, sir. Hello, real time ready captions. You had your hand up. Can you hear me? Or not.
Colleen, you want to give us a sound check, please? It's Colleen. Hello. Hello. I've moved you over to the staff, so if you could mute yourself. Will do. Thank you, James. Karen, this is Tessa. Can you please change your chat function for to who for who can see the chat to organizers and panelists only, please? I have already done that. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. Welcome, Elise. Hello, this is Elisa. Isn't Phil awesome? Say it again. Isn't Phil awesome with yeah, his? Phil is awesome. Yes. <laughs> I'm mean, impressed that he even shared the chat history. Hey, Colleen. Hi. Are we going to have others use their webcams, James, or is that, what are you thinking about that? So I, I'm just a little bit uh, cautious about uh, some people at home with the uh, with bandwidth issues. So Ah, uh, OK. I'll, I'll turn it off. I just wanted to see how it worked. <laughs> Good, though. We're so curious these days in your <laughs> world, James. Yeah, I'm going to raise my hand. I'm going to touch everybody. <laughs> <laughs> we like dabbling in this. <laughs> OK. Well, according to uh, my clock, it's a 2.03 p.m. Shall I start the meeting, Seth? Yes, you shall. Okay. Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, welcome to our first teleconference meeting of the Regional Planning Technical Working Group, uh, also referred to as TWIG. I would really like to thank staff for the efforts you've made to pull this together. And a thank you to everyone on the phone and the web for taking the time to join us today. Uh, before we jump into the meeting, I will confirm for the record that we have a quorum, which I've already done, and yes, we do. So thank you everybody again. And uh, if I could just say to um, bear with me um, uh, through this process as it uh, might be a little bit slower than, than usual as I kind of navigate through uh, the procedural items on my end. Uh, and because this is a new process for us all, uh, I'd like to ask Seth, uh, Seth Lichney to please go over the basic instructions for both the uh, TWIG members as well as the members of the pu public to participate today. Seth? Thank you very much, Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, first, a message for the TWIG members uh, to participate and uh, provide uh, your input on any given item. Um, we ask that you uh, click on the raise hand icon at the top right of the screen. Uh, when the chair sees your hand raised, uh, she'll call on you and she'll try to go uh, in the order that she sees them. Um, everyone's microphone is muted by default, so it's important that you don't touch the microphone icon. Uh, the chair can see the list of all the TWIG members who have their hand raised, and when she calls on you, uh, your microphone will be unmuted by uh, Sandag staff. 
Uh, your microphone icon at the top right of your screen will turn from red to green, so that's when you'll know um, that uh, you can start talking. And again, do not click on the microphone icon yourself. If you mute yourself, we cannot unmute you. And after your comments, you'll be muted again, and the chair will proceed to the next uh, TWIG member in line. For each item on the agenda, the chair will call on staff to present. Uh, you will see their PowerPoint slides on your screen, and after the presentation, we'll follow pretty much our normal process. Uh, we'll take public comment, uh, which will be described in a moment. Uh, the TWIG members can then offer their comments on the item by raising their hands, and as before, the chair will call on the members who have raised their hands and, un and unmute each of them individually. Uh, also, for clarity of the record, uh, please identify yourself each time you speak. Uh, and as we go through this process, like Karen mentioned, it might be a little bit slower than what we normally do, um, so just bear with us on any hiccups. For the members of the public, um, we have uh, comments that were emailed to the clerk in advance of the board meeting. Uh, the public can also email comments during today's meeting. Uh, those should be sent to clerk at sandag.org. Uh, identifying the item number to which the comments pertain and the name of the commenter. At the, after the conclusion of each presentation, we will take any uh, needed time to compile comments that were received on that item. The clerk will then read all comments that were submitted during the meeting. Uh, and that concludes my instructions. Um, we'll be available to assist. With the and members. Somebody needs to mute themselves right now. I think we can hear somebody on the line. Um, but that pretty much concludes the uh, instructions. So I'll hand it back over to you, Karen. Chair Brindley, you're, you're self muted. Okay, with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started with item number two, uh, public comments and member comments. Are there any public comments that need to be read into the record? Yes, I received one public comment um, for the general public comments, and I will read into the record the first minute. Um, it is public comments by Eric Ruer. VRPA Technologies Institute of Transportation Engineers. My name is Eric Ruer and I work with the consulting firm VRPA Technologies. Today I'm also representing the San Diego section of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. I wanted to make sure you are aware of the, seven, of the Senate Bill 743 legislation that will take effect on July 1, 2020. Once SB 743 takes effect, projects will no longer use level of service and delay as a CEQA performance measure, and the new performance measure, Vehicle Miles Traveled, or VMT, will be used to evaluate the environmental impacts of projects. This change will favor projects in info areas with opportunities for trips made by transit, bicycling, and walking. It will also encourage improvements to these travel modes as well as trip reduction strategies to be used as mitigation measures rather than roadway widening and intersection signalization, which have been typical forms of mitigation in the past. Most agencies will still study level of service and delay and will require that projects provide roadway improvements, but this will be done outside of the secret impact and mitigation process. I will provide the full uh, comments for the record to the project manager. Okay, thank you. Moving on to member comments. If any member would like to offer any comments, please raise your hand at this time. Okay, seeing none. Uh, we'll go ahead and move on to agenda item number three, the comprehensive multimodal corridor plans. I will call on Richard Karen? Chavez. Karen, this is Colleen Clemenson, and I don't have the hand raise option. Maybe everybody didn't want me to be raising my hand and asking too many questions, but I wondered if I could just provide a couple comments from item two. Uh, yes, please. And uh, again, uh, thank you, Colleen. Bear with me. I'm, uh, I needed to be reminded to navigate between my attendees and staff uh, windows, so I'll be mindful to do that moving forward. 
So okay. Colleen, great. Very good. Well, I, just, I really want to thank the technical working group for coming together today. This is the first of all of our working groups for us to be holding in this remote fashion. Um, we've had two SANDAG board meetings now and a transportation committee meeting. So um, I'm sure all of you have had some interesting experiences. We do have a COVID-19 item on the agenda later where we hope to um, talk more about that with all of you on how you're doing planning during this time. Um, on behalf of SANDAG, we hope that all of you are staying healthy and that your family members are safe and healthy. Um, we went from an organization that had five laptops that we all shared to deploying laptops to almost every member of the SANDAG organization and, and are all working remotely. So anyway, it's been a very interesting time. Um, one of the big projects that I think all of you have been following is our regional transportation plan and the, the vision, the bold new vision. And we have been working with our board of directors and do not plan to share that vision until we can do that face-to-face -face with our board um, and policy committee members. And that really depends on when everything opens up. And at least for right now, we tentatively have that um, scheduled for a joint meeting of our regional planning and transportation committees on June 5th. Um, I think all of us are, you know, on hold to figure out if that will will happen that day. But we do want to keep all of you in the loop and and more to come on that. And then the only other update I have for you is regarding the regional housing needs assessment. I think most of you are aware that our board of directors took an action last Friday to delay the appeal hearings until such time as those could be held in person. Um, I think there's a lot of questions coming up now about, since we don't know when we'll be coming back together, do we need to revisit that soon? And so anyway, stay tuned, we'll keep you informed there. And again, thank you all of you. And, and to our chair, Karen, thank you for being willing to be the the first uh, working group chair to, to do this. So thank you all. Well, thank you very much, Colleen. I appreciate those comments and the update as far as the actions that are uh, still still uh, in in motion, so to speak, at the on the SANDAG side. So thank you uh, again on that. So with that, uh, as I had started to introduce, uh, we're going to have uh, Richard Chavez from SANDAG to make a presentation on the comprehensive multimodal corridor plans. Thank you. You can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so this goes back to September of last year when Sandy Board of Directors allocated $40 million to complete corridor plans on 12 corridors throughout the San Diego region. Uh, the guidelines are established by the California Transportation Commission and they encourage a multimodal planning approach that includes a lot of public outreach and, and stakeholder engagement. So this process is designed to refine and prioritize and build consensus around transportation solutions that are being outlined in regional plan with the thought that if we can get consensus on what those transportation solutions are, it's gonna make us and the entire region that much more competitive for future state and federal funding possibilities. Next slide. So the 40 million goes towards uh, 12 corridors and these are the first five uh, to be done within the next year or so. Uh, it's the blue line I-5 South corridor. State Route 52, State Route 67, with a consideration for high-speed transit along that corridor. The Sprinter, Palomar Park Road, State Route 78, and State Route 76 corridor, so North County. The Purple Line, Interstate 805 corridor, and the fifth corridor, Central Mobility Hub. Next slide. 
So we had a series of workshops with Caltrans to organize and figure out how we were going to proceed with getting these corridor plans done. Uh, a big part of that workshop was um, to develop work plans for each of the five corridors, uh, get a defined scope and schedule and budget, determine what those data and analysis needs are, uh, determine who's on that team, and to figure out a stakeholder and state in engagement strategy. Next slide. Here's a list of some of the applicable state legislation. Uh, I think Senate Bill 743 is probably the, the preeminent one. Next slide. If you look through the policy considerations that are outlined by California Transportation Commission, Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration, you can kind of boil them all into these 12 categories. And you'll see the strikeout and underline. These were comments that we got from the Transportation Committee back in February. I'm not going to read through all of them, but they're here for your reference. Next slide. This is a rough outline of the implementation schedule. So we're planning to go back to Transportation Committee in May, probably pushing to June, uh, for an overview of where we're at on developing those work plans, kind of what are the key elements coming out of those work plans. Uh, starting stakeholder engagement in summer, that's probably pushing towards fall. And then wrapping these up by summer of 21, which will put us in line for uh, cycle three of, of Senate Bill 1 funding opportunities and, and other opportunities. Uh, later on, uh, starting in the fall, probably heading towards winter, uh, we'll be going back to the Transportation Committee with more of a deep dive on each of the corridors as far as you know, where we're at in the analysis, what we found out through the stakeholder and public outreach, and um, Get, get some good feedback from the Transportation Committee. Next slide. So we're asking the technical working group to assign two representatives that can participate in the quarter plan steering committee. Uh, as part of that organizational structure with Caltrans, we have um, a steering committee that's gonna oversee the teams, oversee the subject matter experts. Uh, the teams do involve staff from the affected cities. But we're looking for you know, two representatives um, that are assigned by the technical working group uh, to participate in what are looking like they're gonna be every other week meetings uh, to talk about where we're at with the quarter planning and to provide assistance and guidance to the five individuals. The steering committee as it, as it is today has is planned to have two technical working group meet members, four from Sandag and five from Caltrans. Uh, big, biggest responsibility is to review those work plans and oversee the implementation of the entire program. Estimating the level of commitment at, at 10 hours uh, per month. And like I mentioned earlier, the, the cities and county staff also have individual representatives on the, the quarter teams in their jurisdiction. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Richard, for that for that presentation and overview. Uh, at this point, uh, I'd like to ask the clerk of the board: Are there any public comments on this item? There are no public comments on this item. Thank you. So, on to that. Let's uh, ask if there are any member comments. And uh, just as a reminder, if you could raise your virtual hand, there, I will call uh, in the order that I see them uh, show up. So let's uh, go ahead and do that now. Just bear with me as I kind of navigate through my screen and confirm that uh, there are no hand. I'm not seeing any hands show up uh, as far as the request to speak on this uh, particular item. Let me navigate over to the staff bar. Okay, I'm not seeing any requests to speak on uh, on this particular item. So uh, because this was a discussion item only, uh, thank you very much, Richard. And uh, we'll go, go ahead and move on to uh, agenda item number four, given I don't see any comments uh, at this point. And I'm gonna call on David Tedrow to, uh, from Sandag to make a presentation on the Department of Finance population estimate. David. 
share. This is James. Uh, David is um, just now joining again. Um, David, if you hear me um, on your control panel, your audio, you'll see where the pin is. We're having some difficulty with David. We could go to the next item. Okay, so uh, let's let's go ahead and do that uh, while David gets his uh, technical issues resolved. Let's go ahead and move on to agenda item number five, uh, which is uh, just overall discussion points here. That interested to hear on uh, how all of us are conducting our planning uh, during the COVID nineteen. Uh, health issues. So uh, with that, there's really no uh, report per se, but I would like to uh, uh, introduce Seth to uh, see if he'd like to start the discussion. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I think essentially what we were looking for is to, and we've, we've heard a little bit of feedback from uh, some of your jurisdictions individually, um, but we wanted to have a discussion about what uh, are some of the challenges that you're experiencing um, what are your your major concerns about uh, basically performing your functions as as planning and community development departments? Um, there was concern about being able, for example, being able to do public outreach. Um, is it a concern that your city has? Are there uh, ideas that are being floated for how you can complete your your public outreach, um, or is it something that just seems like it it it's going to be a real challenge to accomplish? We also wanted to focus on some of the short-term concerns uh, and then some of the long-term long concerns as well. Um, thinking about, uh, uh, about telecommuting and some of the other issues um, that might come up with that and whether or not it's something that maybe could be uh, something that, that planning departments consider doing in the long term. Um, Colleen, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that whatever tools you're using, I think we want this to be a forum for information sharing. If there are tools that Sandag has where we can be helpful to you, we'd love to do that. Um, we put in place at Sandag a whole lot of um, protocols for telecommuting, and if that can be useful to any of you and your staffs, we want to make that available. And then I think, you know, this really kind of gets more to the planning aspect. We have this almost laboratory for learning where we shut down what 75% of the economy. We've seen a 40 plus percent reduction in traffic. Um, you know, I think there are people and I'm certainly one of them who never thought they could get used to telecommuting and now I could imagine doing it more often. And the air is so much cleaner. It's just remarkably cleaner. And so I think those are some of the things that we're thinking about at, at Sandag, everything from, you know, how we do public outreach, how we engage people, what does this mean um, for planning and what can we learn in this period of time, and then just how this functions going forward. So those were just a few things to plant some seeds with all of you. And again, really want to hear what all of you are thinking, what you're doing, how you're coping and so forth. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. So before we uh, before we start the the twig discussion, I'd like to uh, ask the clerk of the board if there are any public comments on this item. There are no public comments on this item. Okay. With that said, let's go ahead and see how many hands can I can get to come up. Let's uh, let's try to get some some good dialogue here from our twig members as far as uh, how you guys are are going about uh, your your planning activities. So now's the time to raise your hand. I've got uh, Alyssa Muto from City of San Diego. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, we the planning department is we're in week five, I think, of our remote workforce, um, and it's been going really well. I think for us, it was cutting the cord, the literal cord, to our desk space. Um, that was one of the most challenging and and trying to migrate to a cloud-based system and um, but we are very fortunate our 
planners and engineers have been quick to make that transition and find ways through Microsoft Teams, um, through Zoom to collaborate and coordinate face-to-face -face or um, via messaging. Uh, using the Microsoft Teams platform has been extremely helpful for us. Um, it has noted, we have noted that there are numerous personnel in the city in our branch of the city that cannot be remote um, or need to be able to have the VPN access or at least be able to rotate through office space to do some essential functions. Um, but it really has shown to be a productive uh, work uh, setting still nonetheless. And um, you know we're looking at what we can be integrating long term in a remote workforce. Um, right now, what we know is telecommuting 100%, but really, how do you make those teams more fluid and able to jump into a multidisciplinary group um, and then find those rem remote workspaces um, and really just be flexible? So we're up and doing it. And if anybody has any questions of how we have been able to launch that, I'm happy to share that with you. Uh, thank you, Alyssa. Um, appreciate appreciate that. I, it sounds like uh, that's somewhat consistent with uh, what some of the other organizations are doing relative to uh, kind of having to immediately figure out uh, this this new normal, so to speak, as far as how we communicate each other with each other and and still get the uh, the work completed. So next up, I've I've got a uh, request from uh, Joe Smith from Del Mar to uh, provide some content. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. So similar to Alyssa, we we also converted over to telecommute pretty quickly. And Del Mar has uh, had a, a vision of going 100% digital with our, our planning applications with this, this uh, even greater vision of even taking building all the way over to uh, a remote digital platform anyway. And, um, and then we were obviously forced into that. And so we used it as a testing ground. And there's a software that we've been using called Bluebeam, uh, those that know of it. Uh, because of the Bluebeam software, it's been able, uh, we were able to do all of our stamping and plan reviews digitally, which was a big help. And then also just project tracking through uh, track it software. And then we're doing all of our payments by credit card right now. And that seems to be, you know, abiding um, the time uh, during this, this time right now. So that's been helpful. Um, we are resuming this month our design review board meetings, our planning commission meetings, and then we have a, a couple committees uh, like our housing task force. Um, all those are being done through Zoom. I know that's a pretty typical software right now. And then with our public hearings for the Design Review Board, which are our main project hearings, we're actually letting applicants uh, be a panelist on Zoom, and so they would get their 10 minutes like normal, and they'll be able to present, um, share their screen, that type of thing, and then we uh, we take them out of the agenda item. So at least they're there to be able to participate but we haven't gone there yet for uh, live public comment. It's it's typical to what's being done here where folks email in. And then I think just the last, last piece I wanted to add, um, Colleen had asked, you know, what help Sandag could offer during this time. And I know us amongst many other cities are feeling very constrained right now about the housing element timeframes. We did submit a letter to HCD. Uh, we submitted a second letter, like I know some other cities have to the governor requesting extensions on these. HCD's position has been that it's been set by statute, and so they really can't do anything. It's up to the governor and legislature. So I would just really ask Sandag to um, try to do what they can to help with uh, those timeframes and plus any other timeframes related to CEQA. Um, I know SB 743 is right around the corner. So there's just a lot there, and any help that, um, that Sandag could give, I think all the cities would appreciate. But um, that's all that we had to offer. All right. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate that. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Jeff Murphy from Carlsbad. Um, so Carlsbad, we're still operational. Obviously, like most everybody, we don't have any in-person services. Um, we're still working on e-submittals. So now we have customers come in and drop off plans um, because of the rains. We, we ended up getting um, covered trash cans to Put them in so you guys can laugh amongst yourselves on the symbolism there. Um, I would say that 78% of development services staff is telecommuting. 
Um, what we're doing is they'll they'll come in and pick up and drop off plans, but most most of everything they do can be done at home. We still have um, obviously building inspection staff that come in and and even the technicians that um, normally would be coming in dealing with customers, even they are on a telecommuting schedule. Um, we've noticed about a I'd say about a 25% drop in um, permit activity and inspections. The inspection side could be the drop could be just because of the rains we've had for the last couple of weeks, um, but we've noticed the permit numbers are also dropping. Um, some of the more complex ones are really uh, dropping off. Um, as far as meetings, um, we're we're on Zoom. We haven't had any Zoom bombs, knock on wood, yet. But uh, we handle all of our public meetings that way. We had our first planning commission meeting last night that went off without a hitch. We had, I think, we've had three or four city council hearings. Um, we'll be it'll be interesting this next Tuesday because we'll have some pretty controversial items that will be. Um, heard that night and I would say the one you know one thing that's really awkward is the, the public comments where people have to um, you know email them in and then the city clerk reads them um, it's it's really awkward and you really can't see um, the you know the, the the expressions from any of the you know the, the, the council members themselves or any of the, actually or other staff because you get kind of muted but um, the only thing I also we have to say, I, I echo the same concerns we have with the housing element. We're doing what we can. We have an advisory committee that is also having Zoom meetings that are working, but we're not getting, obviously, the, the level of engagement that is traditional when updating a, a important plan like the housing element. Um, so we're, we'll start moving forward, um, um, given the deadline, but we are hopeful that we can get an extension so we can engage the community a little better than we are now. That's all I have. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, I certainly appreciate that uh, uh, comment and, and feedback. Uh, I, I, although I'm not seeing a whole lot of hands uh, show up here on the screen, uh, I, I do think uh, it's probably a very common thought as far as the uh, potential impact that we're, we're having uh, just on a region-wide basis on the preparation of our housing elements. Uh, at this particular juncture, it's uh, probably a lot of the outreach activities um, have been impacted uh, through COVID and really doing what we can as it relates to um, continuing the forward momentum, but uh, recognizing the importance of the uh, public interface as it relates to the preparation of these plans. Uh, so, you know, certainly the, that uh, deadline that's looming a year out is literally just around the corner as it's in planning uh, time frames. So uh, again, not seeing any other hands up. Uh, I, I would offer uh, just a couple of comments here. Uh, in Santa Marcos, I think similar to what the other jurisdictions who've spoken, um, we also have uh, essentially gone to that uh, vir more of that virtual environment. Uh, we were gearing up uh, like Del Mar to go to an electronic plan checking system. Uh, as well as some minimal submittals, and we've been uh, uh, able to expedite that as it relates to uh, trying to put some processes in place relative to uh, having folks be able to submit uh, electronically, but also uh, similar to Carlsbad, have a system in place where people can still uh, come to City Hall and uh, drop the plans, and then there's a, uh, I guess, an incubation period for those plans before they're they're processed. Um, uh, at the staff level. Um, we have uh, been undergoing our general plan update. Uh, the months of March and April, we were slated to uh, really get out and have the boots on the ground, so to speak, with our public uh, outreach activities. And we managed to get one uh, public meeting in place uh, before uh, COVID really uh, started ramping up. And so uh, we are uh, essentially uh, working to go more virtual with that outreach uh, activities and uh, how we'll actually accomplish that, that's uh, still being flushed out. Um, but we're really looking at it as, as a, a positive in the respect that we're hoping that we'll actually get more public participation by going more into that virtual platform. And then uh, as the months evolve, have an opportunity to, uh, as, you know, as appropriate, um, be able to also have some uh, in-person public outreach as well. So um, that's been the impact to our, our uh, general plan update process. 
uh, like Jeff, we've got uh, quite a bit of our development services staff that is working remotely. Uh, however, not everybody has uh, access to a laptop or Surface uh, with VPN access. And so we do have uh, some staff that rotate through on a, a, a scheduled basis as it relates to just uh, being able to, to uh, continue the overall workflow. Um, we will be uh, looking at um, uh, trying to establish uh, work plans in place to, to uh, essentially go back to sort of somewhat, I shouldn't say business as usual, but uh, understanding that we may uh, have more staffing uh, that come back to City Hall. Uh, we are in the process of um, essentially trying to establish those protocols. So I, I would certainly be interested in, in any input that um, the group would have as it relates to uh, the thoughts that uh, uh, your jurisdictions have as far as how to accomplish that. If there's uh, any, any feedback to be provided on that, uh, I'd ask that you raise your hands at this point. It uh, looks like we've got a couple more uh, requests for comments. So I've got, uh, let me just call on the order on my screen. Let's go to John Connolly from Vista. Uh, let's see. Are we able to get uh, John John's comments? His microphone is on, but we cannot hear him. Okay. So uh, perhaps uh, so right now we I, we cannot hear John Conley. So uh, John, you might uh, want to call in. I think that's an option. Uh, Otherwise, let me go ahead and skip down to uh, David from uh, Poway and let's uh, give him an opportunity to speak. Yeah, hey, Dave DeVries, City of Poway. Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to go back to the original discussion here. Uh, we're taking plan checks in. We're basically back to full service as of this week. We're taking in everything by mail and PDF. We're requiring both. That way, those who are telecommuting can if they want to review it by PDF or if they want to come in and pick up their their plans, they can they can pick those up, take them home and then and then review them that way. Uh, like many of you, we're probably about 75% uh, telecommuting and then the other 25% are here at City Hall, uh, including myself. And uh, we're not allowing anybody from the public into City Hall. So all the conversations are by email and I'm getting used to all these little tricks that uh, IT's had for a very long time. And, and so it's been interesting doing a lot of different teleconferencing and, and things along those lines. I have been able to allow uh, staff to, to contact members of the public from their, from their houses uh, via phone through some of the, the teleconferencing software. And also they use star 67 so that their numbers don't show up when they're calling somebody um, from the public as well. So that, that's been uh, helpful, you know, just to get some of these calls answered. Everything that's uh, coming in by mail, we're quarantine, uh, quarantining for two to three days. That I have to thank Joe Lim and Solana Beach for. He, he was the one who, who gave me some of his processes related to that. So, so we're definitely utilizing that piece of it. Inspections were pretty much uh, full. Uh, on inspections again we're doing interior and exterior with uh, all the inspections we're only allowing one person on the job site period and that person has to be wearing a mask so that's uh that's part of the inspection process also if they're doing interior inspections they have to seal off the area of inspection and a pathway to that area of inspection and have it vacated for a minimum period of 24 hours so that uh, helps the safety part of it a little bit. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what we're, we're, we're doing. Uh, what I'm struggling with right now is how I'm going to do my first housing element workshop. I'm, I think it's inevitable that I've got to do this thing remotely. So I, I've got some ideas in my head, but if any of you have any thoughts or ideas for me on this, uh, please feel free to reach out to me, um, uh, ddevries.poway.org, 
and I'd, I'd love to hear what's happening and, and uh, you're welcome to enter in the discussion here. But thanks everyone and, and good luck to everyone during this crisis. Okay, thank you. Doesn't look like I have uh, any other hands going up. Uh, one last question that I, I would like to present to the group is just kind of moving forward um, as we you know, navigate through the, uh, the, the COVID uh, process, uh, just the overall long-term, uh, I guess, implications for planning or how, we'll, how, how it's anticipated that uh, everyone will be planning during the, I would say, kind of the slowdown of the economy and, and anything that's been thought of at this point relative to, uh, you know, strategies of, of navigating through that. Uh, so that's just kind of a br very broad question, but uh, interested to hear if anyone has uh, any thoughts on that particular item. Okay, uh, let's see, I do have a hand up from Alyssa Muto from City of San Diego. Yes, uh, so we don't have anything specific yet, but we're definitely, I think, approaching what we're doing for planning in two phases. We have the present phase that we're all living in, um, with the pandemic, and then we have the recovery phase. So we're really seeing that that is our opportunity, especially as long-range planners, uh, to look at our code, look at our plans, um, to really see how we can create that, that stimulating environment that can work in the upward um, momentum that might be slow, um, for all different aspects, whether it's housing or business, um, with our economic development department, um, our sustainability and looking at how that can be a, a theme in our recovery, um, and just what is needed in the code and in our policies to get there. So that's, that's definitely something that we're brainstorming on our end um, as a planning department. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that uh, that input. Um, not seeing any other hands go up. I think that's going to uh, do it for agenda item number five. I really appreciate uh, hearing uh, how other folks are navigating through the the pandemic, and I think it's been uh, beneficial for all of us to uh, to hear. Um, it seems like a, a lot of us are 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 doing kind of this, the same kind of strategies as far as uh, really being innovative and trying to uh, uh, rally our teams to uh, be able to look to deliver the, the levels of service that uh, our communities expect, but uh, do it in a much different uh, manner than what we're, what we're used to. So uh, thank you again uh, for everybody who's participated in that uh, particular discussion. Um, what I'd like Karen, to do- I a, Karen, it's Colleen, and I just had a few follow-up questions for people, if you'll indulge me. Uh, absolutely, and I didn't <laughs> see your hand, Colleen, and I didn't see it up. So um, I don't, you know what? I don't have a hand icon. I think it's on purpose because I always chime in too much. <laughs> you know what? That's, that's perfectly fine, and I certainly appreciate you uh, uh, interjecting here. So yeah, let's go ahead and hear what you have to say. So the There's first thing I wanted to to mention. Colleen. Oh, yeah. It's. I just want to clarify for the chair that you will not see hand raises for the staff. You will only see them for the attendees. If staff needs to speak, they're going to have to, to, to kind of chime in like Colleen did. Yeah, I Thank wanted you. to make sure, Karen, you didn't think that was you. It's for the staff, but you know I'm such a chimer. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> and thank you, Tessa, for that clarification. I appreciate it. Yes. Colleen? Yeah. Okay. So the first um, question I have, and, and if anybody knows off the top of their heads, um, I don't know what, because I haven't done a housing element in several years, what the outreach requirements are for housing elements. Certainly Seth and I can look into that. We did get a letter from the city of Solana Beach um, asking that the Sandag Board of Directors get behind the um, request that was made to the league. So our board chair is considering that and whether or not to bring that to the board. So just wanted to let you know that. And then I think what Seth and I all need to do is, is be able to describe for our board members what the outreach requirements are and the, and the concerns 
related to meeting that. So I wanted to throw that out there as a question to the group. Um, the second thing, just a resource that I wanted to make available to you, our chief economist, Ray Major, has um, done a lot of work recently looking at the reduction in sales tax and what that could mean going forward, depending on how long we're in a shutdown. And I don't know if all of you have seen that, but I'm gonna ask Seth to send the fact sheet out to all of you, because I think you might find that useful in your planning work. I know that he has been contacted, Ray has been contacted by a couple of the other cities on how the methodology we're using, because I know that's um, you know, a, a considerable concern for all the, the local jurisdictions in the region. And then the third thing, I just wondered if any of you are experiencing furloughs at this point in time. So those were the three kind of questions and comments that I just wanted to put out to the to the group. Okay, I'm going to ask it. Uh, I'm going to ask the members here if you've got any uh, feedback on that for Colleen. Need you to raise your hand as a just as a reminder. Let's go to Carlsbad, uh, Jeff Murphy. Hi. Uh, so, I as far as the public engagement, um, I, I'm not sure what the state requires. I know they do require that you have a public engagement plan and 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 a process that you go through i think our bigger concern is our city council and residents expect to be you know thoroughly engaged in in these type of, of plan updates and so i think there's a certain expectation that that our residents and, and businesses have that we need to follow and and what's happening is this covid um uh, lockdown is 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 really limiting our ability to really engage the community that they're used to how they're used to being engaged so i think that's that's kind of probably the bigger issue that we're running into um, as far as uh, furloughs there are you know, we do not have furloughs um, most of the non-essential workers were able to um, um, be trained and help in other areas that um, that that um, do have um, need or needed some assistance so we're, we're actually in good shape Okay, thank you, Jeff. I'm gonna just uh, try to call on the hands that I saw kind of pop up in the in the order. Let's uh, go to Vicki White. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so I just pulled up the HCD building blocks real quickly. Um, and it seems like the effort is, or the government code is kind of general, uh, local government shall make a diligent effort to achieve public participation of all economic segments of the community in the development of the housing element. And then you have to describe that effort um, in the document. And then there was a recommendation to have an official public hearing uh, prior to the release of the draft. Um, so we went to our planning commission with a, an informational item only, not an action item for the city of San Diego. That's it. All right, thank you, I appreciate that. So let's go ahead and go to uh, uh, Dave from uh, City of Poway. Oh. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, just to let you know some history on, on my experiences with the housing element, generally I've, I've used uh, online surveys for some of the initial outreach, and then we'll conduct one workshop saying, you know, hey, what would you like to see in the housing element? Here's what we did the last time. And then we complete the draft and we go back to the public and we say, hey, you know, this is, this is what we came up with. Did we get it right? Are we missing anything? But I definitely encourage everyone to check with HCD, the staff members, and make sure they're on board with whatever your public outreach program is. I know they're doing a lot of focus on fair housing for this cycle, and you wanna make sure that you're you know, reaching out to a, a good portion of all members of your community. Regarding furloughs, I haven't heard that yet. Um, hiring freeze is also kind of on the table, but we'll, we'll see as, as time goes on here. Uh, that's it. All right, thanks, Dave. Uh, let's go to uh, Joe Smith from City of Del Mar. Yeah, just um, just similar to what Dave just mentioned, we've been talking to HCD, and I think the expectation is that there is at least one public workshop, which is tricky right now. 
um, obviously. I just wanted to share that the, uh, the community survey tool that we're using this go around is, is through MetroQuest. And I know that um, many of you have used that. I think Encinitas did it for their housing element. And we're currently um, in a survey period right now, which, uh, which worked out anyway. But it's a, it's a pretty uh, good tool. It helps drive you through the slides instead of a, a typical survey um, like we've all seen. So that seems to be really effective. And um, we just talked to Paul at HCD yesterday. We talked to him about our results so far. And it, seem, it seems like they, you know, they, uh, he felt that uh, between a between a workshop and a survey um, criteria coming in that that you know that counts for what the statute requires plus the the public hearings coming up and so forth. Wonderful. All right. Thanks, Joe. Uh, let's go ahead and go down to Mike Strong, City of Escondido. Uh, yes. Thank you, everyone, um, and and thanks for uh, being flexible and accommodating to to conduct these meetings electronically. Um, and certainly hope everyone's safe. But uh, I just wanted to offer some some thoughts and perhaps a greater solicitation for the rest of the people attending. Um, it was represented that the city of Del Mar submitted written correspondence um, as a formal request to extend the due date of housing element. Um, and I just want to say that I've also expressed interest just to Sandeg staff, perhaps at an informal capacity, but. Uh, I wouldn't take the silence or non-response from other cities as uh, being complacent. I think we all share an interest in extending the, the due date uh, given these challenging times. Um, and I think it goes beyond just the public participation component, although uh, I share similar concerns about any engagement activities um, between now and you know long after the, the shelter in place or spatial uh, distance separation requirements are lifted. Um, the, Programmatic requirements are pretty straightforward, but uh, as we know, each uh, agency's constituency is very unique and have different needs. And one of the big things that HCD looks for is opportunities to engage those that are underrepresented in the processes. And sometimes that's you know language barriers, sometimes it's availability. Um, and certainly if we're looking at the lower income populations who the housing elements are intended to serve, probably uh, the best in terms of utility is, uh, you know, those people don't necessarily have adequate access to online engagement, um, especially faced with the crisis where they may be um, out of uh, work or, you know, working different hours to make ends meet. Um, so uh, the other issue that's probably more salient also, and this also dovetails into some of the issues that were brought up earlier about furloughs. Um, the city of Escondido is looking at probably a revenue loss of about $4 million um, through June. Uh, and certainly that has already identified some preliminary uh, operational uh, issues with the current fiscal cycle, uh, but it's going to completely change our next year's operating um, budget and employee budget. And I, I have a suspicion and clearly expect that a lot of priorities are going to be shifting uh, and, and focusing more on essential core service delivery uh, rather than policy development. Although most of us acknowledge that when the economy is uh, thriving, uh, that it's it's very difficult to devote any attention to policy. And it's more focused on land use development. And then when we are pressed with recessions, that's the best time to shift into policy development because you actually have time to work on it. But um, upper management and electeds typically don't don't consider that or look at it that way. Uh, so I just want to make sure that's clear that at least from the city of Escondido perspective, we are also very interested in having an extension for the aforementioned reasons. Um, but during this this time, we, we have been focusing on process related improvements and soliciting new ways to reach out to different community groups to make sure they still know that the city is running, the city is uh, conducting business, um, and that will also lead to hopefully uh, new networking opportunities and way to engage engage people. Uh, one thing that I found pretty uh, beneficial, at least in the initial four or five weeks that we've been in this period, is the ongoing collaboration with other member agencies. Uh, in, in North County, we've, we've had this longstanding North County Collaborative Forum uh, where we had met on a quarterly basis, um, but now we have a, a recurring call on Fridays uh, to kind of discuss like how we're doing, how are we even handling personnel issues and trying to keep morale up or 
creating works, uh, safe workspaces, ergometric issues in people's homes. Um, so I would encourage cities to also look to that and have little breakout discussions on best practices and continue sharing information. Um, and I know Mr. Smith is, is new to Del Mar and we'll have to make sure that you're included on these new uh, weekly recurring meetings. Um, anyway, that's all I got to say from Escondido and I'll turn it back over to you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate those uh, those comments. Um, before I uh, offer San Marcos's comments, I just wanted to see if uh, we were able to get uh, the microphone issue resolved with John Connolly. Yes, I'm here, Karen. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Thanks, John, for uh, being patient and navigating through. We're interested to hear what you have to say. No, I'm sorry. I had some mic issues earlier, but I just wanted to uh, say two things. I agree with the comments on public input. That's definitely the most difficult issue for us moving forward here and, and just making sure that we can accommodate that so the public hearings have been a challenge and I'm interested in any agency's um, you know opinions or recommendations as to how you know they can make that better I'm just looking forward to getting to the end where we can have public meetings where they can where people can feel like they have meaningful input but the second issue on a kind of a positive note is um, with respect to the SANDAG meetings that we have, the regional meetings, we have a lot of staff at all the cities that come down to SANDAG several times a month for meetings on a regular basis. And I know that it's hard, but I appreciate all the effort that their staff put into putting these remote meetings together. And I'd just like to be able to maybe consider an option doing, having an, a remote option in the future, because I think it would save a lot of jurisdictions a lot of time and effort. That's my comment. Thanks. All right, thanks, John. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. So, uh, from San Marcos's perspective, uh, Colleen presented three questions to to uh, to us um, regarding the housing element. I I don't have much uh, uh, different to offer than uh, what's already been provided relative to some of the challenges related to the the public outreach. And uh, I think as been as it's been discussed, you know, there's the statutory requirement, and then there's the what did you really do uh, above and beyond to, to make sure that you were uh, collecting and, and reaching out to, as Mike said, either the underrepresented uh, community. Um, we also have that new component as far as fair housing. So uh, I, I think that's really the what's the challenge point uh, for San Marcos at this uh, juncture. Uh, there is a little bit of a benefit because we're, we're rolling, it, it's one big process as it relates to our general plan update and some of the outreach activities that are ongoing with, with that effort, um, working hand in hand with our housing element. Uh, but nevertheless, it's critical as we are formulating some of our land use alternatives uh, re related to some of our sites inventory that um, we have an opportunity to, to vet that through the public so that, um, speaking to Jeff's point, as you get into those, those hearing uh, in environments and the back and forth with HCD that uh, there's opportunities that, you know, it's understood as far as what's being proposed on very site specific locations if it's if you're looking at a uh, a land use change. So th those are some of the challenges I think that are uh, ahead of us. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll be able to find the technological tools to uh, you know to to overcome some of those uh, some of those constraints, but um, it, you know it's a fluid uh, process here, so we'll continue to 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 uh, make sure that we have that forward momentum. Uh, as it relates to furloughs, uh, for the month of April, San Marcos did go to uh, what uh, I, I characterize, and it's, it's just my characterization, as furlough Fridays. Um, we already work a 980, so uh, typically we had uh, every other Friday off, but for the month of April, um, we have all Fridays off. So, uh, and that's basically all of the um, non-public safety and, and some of those non-essential uh, positions that are uh, affected by that. Uh, moving forward, uh, there's nothing beneficial as far as from the city manager or city council at this point, but uh, I would just anticipate that there'll be some uh, continuation of that, uh, just given uh, you know what we all know about the, the impacts to our, our budgets um, through the end of June and then moving forward as far as uh, ongoing impacts to uh, our revenue streams and, and just overall abilities to uh, continue to deliver services. So that's uh, that's all I've got as far as the, the feedback to uh, Colleen on her 
on her questions. Um, before I kick it back to agenda item four, I don't see any uh, other hands raised on my screen here. So I just wanted to, to verify that there's no other requests to uh, provide comment on this item. Okay, wonderful. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, Michael Cohen from uh, City of Santee. Sorry, uh, Michael Coyne, can you guys hear me? Yes, and uh, apologize on the pronunciation of your name there. No, no, it's fine. It's Coyne, you pronounced it correctly. Um, so regarding the our approach for the housing element update and the public outreach, so we've already conducted our first uh, public hearing before the city council on our inventory of sites. Fortunately, that occurred prior to the COVID outbreak. Uh, moving forward, we were assessing how should we, you know, continue outreach. Um, and in reviewing the environmental requirements, environmental clearance requirements for the housing element and the corresponding, you know, zoning reclassifications, general plan amendments, we're finding that perhaps the uh, framework that the EIR, we're looking at a program EIR for all the corresponding zone changes, that perhaps that framework where you have an initial scoping meeting um, would allow for more public participation because uh, the housing element in and of itself is kind of an, it's kind of abstract to the public. It's more like the resulting effects of the housing element and the inventory of sites and the regional housing needs allocation that has like a clear impact on the public. And so we're finding that maybe with the, you know, scope, we're, we're programming a scoping session in the future. And we were thinking, you know, maybe having um, some sort of uh, either virtual session or have, you know, uh, because with scoping meetings, there, there's obviously not, a set parameter. In the past, we've had it open throughout the day, so we were thinking maybe we could take in phone calls during the day. And so I think that's our, we're looking at the framework that the environmental process provides as well um, for our, our public outreach. And just a suggestion to look at that as a possibility for additional outreach. All right, thank you, Michael, appreciate that. Karen, if okay. there aren't any other speakers, I this is Colleen again. I just wanted to say thank you to everyone. I really, really appreciate all your input and it's definitely giving us lots of things to um, think about. So thanks, and Karen, you're doing an awesome job. Good I'll job. That. Certainly appreciate that. Uh, I, I can't say enough as far as the SANDAG staff uh, providing the, the prep for me. So uh, appreciate that and, and shout out to all of the SANDAG staff as well. So uh, wonderful. Again, I think that was a, a good amount of dialogue on that particular item. So let's go ahead and uh, jump back to uh, Richard Chavez to uh, cover uh, agenda item number four, which is on the uh, Department of Finance uh, population estimates. So uh, Richard, you're up. Sure, I believe that's David. Oh, uh, David, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. See, that's see that's what happens when I have my, uh, my notes right in front of me. So that would be uh, David Tedrow. Thank you. Go ahead, David. Okay, uh, sounds like maybe we're having some technical difficulties with uh, David as well. Is that accurate? No, we got those solved. I don't know what's up. I just sent him a chat. Okay. So uh, let's see here. I think we're uh, getting kind of near the uh, the end of the, we only got a couple of items here left on the agenda. Uh, why don't we go ahead and just move on David to. David is having some difficulty. He's David, self -muted. You just... There he is. Oh, hi, this is David Tedrow. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes. Uh, wonderful news here, okay. David. Why don't you go ahead and kick it off? Sure. Hi, again, sorry for the um, technical problem. 
Um, my name is David Tedrow. I'm the manager of the Demographic and Economic Forecasting Group. Uh, that's the group that generates the SANDAG population forecast and annual estimates, as well as the economic forecast. And um, so are, are, can you see the uh, PowerPoint presentation? Okay, now I can see it. So Seth, uh, next slide. Okay, so what I'm here to talk about is the new uh, Department of Finance forecast that came out in January of 2020 and the impact it has on the resulting SANDAG regional forecast. And um, the DOF uh, creates a, a forecast for every county in the state and per SB 375, all MPOs must use a forecast that's within plus or minus of 1.5% of the Department of Finance's forecast. And um, so as a result of that in 2018, SANDAG made the decision to simply use the DOS forecast as our regional level forecast. And so, so that's what we do. And uh, the DOF, uh, they, they generate a forecast at the region level for every year from 2010 through 2050. And that includes the, the total population for the region for each year, and then the total population broken out by age, gender, as well as race, ethnicity. And then they, they generate this uh, forecast every um, two or three years. Um, the, 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 they, like I mentioned, they, they just released one in January of 2020. Prior to that, they had released one in uh, 2017. Next slide. So the, the recent history of, of Sandag's forecast, uh, we created uh, originally uh, our forecast in 2018. And at that time, the intent was that was a forecast that was going to be used for both the 2019 federal and regional plans. Um, and, you know, the forecast at that time used the 2017 DOF forecast. And that is the version of the forecast that was, in fact, used for the 2019 federal RT, R, RTP. Um, however, you know, SANDAG received, a, you know, approval to delay the regional forecast and release that in 2021, which um, enabled us to receive some additional input data. Um, specifically, we, in, in the early part of 29, received additional capacities from um, several local uh, jurisdictions. And then, of course, uh, in, in January of 2020, we received the new regional population forecast from the DOF. So the current version of the SANDAG forecast and the version that will be used in the 2021 regional plan uh, incorporates both this um, capacity we received in, in 2019, as well as the uh, most recent Department of Finance uh, forecast. Next slide. So what happened uh, with this new forecast from the DOF that came out in 2020? And um, in, in this graph, the blue line is the original 2017 forecast. And then the lower green line is the 2020 uh, forecast. And you can see that in the 2017 or original version of the DOF forecast, um, we had a projection of in 2050, a population, a total population in the region, uh, just under 4 million. The green line, you can see that in the new forecast, the you know the region is still growing we're still adding population 
but were uh, increasing at a, a slower rate. And so in the new uh, forecast, the total population in the region is forecasted to be about 3.7 million people, so a decrease in the growth, uh, a decrease of about 261 people. Um, and if, if you look at the um, value of the original forecast in 2035, that is about where the 2050 value for the new forecast is. So we're, we're, we're basically now forecasted to take until 2050 what we had previously um, thought to be getting by 2035. So we're still increasing in population, just at a slower rate. Next slide. So this, uh, I'll talk a moment about the reasons for uh, you know, why this forecast changed. Um, the first is that birth rates are, are continuing to decline and, and, and that's uh, become uh, somewhat more pronounced. So um, households, people are, are waiting longer to, to have, have children. Um, the second is with regard to life expectancy. It is still increasing. We're, we're still being forecast to, to, to live longer, but that, the rate of that increase has slowed down. The, the third factor that um, impacted the, the population growth is the, the migration into the county. And that decreased significantly by almost uh, 50% compared to the prior forecast. And that, that primarily had to do with how the Department of Finance kind of estimated, estimates migration. And in, in this version of the forecast, they're looking at just the, the prior 10 years and prior to that, they were going back uh, about 20, 25 years. And in the, the most recent 10 years, migration has been much lower than it was if you look at a larger time frame. So that net migration uh, is, is a major Im impact to why the uh, growth forecast is lower than it was before. So next slide. So as, as you can see uh, above, the, the population has a decrease of about 261,000 people or a decrease of 6.6%. Well, how does that impact other uh, variables for the region? It uh, reduces, as you would expect, the number of households that we forecast will be needed in 2050 and the number of housing units both go down by 125, 133,000. Um, the number of jobs we forecast goes up slightly. Uh, and the reason for that is that although the total population in the region for 2050 is now lower than the original forecast, the number of people in working ages 18 to 65 is a little bit higher. So that uh, translates into, um, that's why the, the number of jobs increases. Okay. Next slide. So the next slide. So at the, like I mentioned before, um, the DOF generates a, a forecast for every county in the region. And um, this chart shows uh, some of the, oh, I'm sorry, the, the, we should be on the chart that shows the, the, the list of counties. 
I think my computer is delayed, so I can't see uh, initially what's what's actually on the screen. I think it's the prior so slide. It, okay, good. Um, so, like I mentioned, San Diego re County, we saw a 6.6% a decrease. The the state in, entirely sh sh saw an 8.6%, and you know the, the vast majority of counties also saw um, a, a decrease. Um, you know, some more than than 10 percent. It's a uh, little more pronounced in uh, the Southern California counties, um, with the exception of, of Orange County. But you can see, you know, Los Angeles, San Bernardino, et cetera, all experience, um, you know, larger decreases even than than in San Diego. So uh, the the next slide should be the the products that are impacted the sandag products that are impacted by um, our forecast so you know the the numbers that i've been talking about have all been at the regional level but in our forecast those all get pushed down to the jurisdiction level and, and even farther to the sandag mgra level so that's uh, part of the forecast has has just been completed and that feeds into SANDAG's travel model, the ABM model development, and, and the recalibration of that tool. And then that, in turn, is used by the travel modelers to, to generate um, the, the travel information and travel metrics like VMT and greenhouse gases and, and, and whatnot. So, so those are all impacted by this, as to our the um, you know specific uh, regional level or local level actions in terms of you know it's going to impact the density of, of housing going forward and where those are located. It, it's going to um, impact <coughs> the um, the economic forecast that we generate that helps to generate the uh, transnet revenues. It 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 will. Uh, impact all of the databases that we provide to other local uh, authorities or agencies as, as well as the custom data requests that SANDAG receives and processes through its um, service bureau. So all of those are get impacted in turn just by uh, this one change by, by the DOF. And so next slide. So what we are uh, have been doing since we received this is the, the first thing we did was reach out to the Department of Finance to understand the, the assumptions that went into their forecast. We've had dialogue uh, with them and, you know, I can say that th this is the final forecast. This is the one we're going to be using. Um, it's and thus we've moved on to modifying our current regional um, growth of forecast and bringing it down to the to the local level, and that has just been um, completed. The <coughs> excuse me, the travel model development group is now recalibrating the the ABM uh, based on these new numbers. We've kind of coordinated with, with Seth and, and, and the RENA uh, with regard to, um, you know, their calculations. Uh, we, we've implemented the, these new growth for, forecast numbers and, you know, prior to, to the COVID uh, situation, revised the transnet uh, forecast based on, on this new regional totals going through to 2050. And then next slide. And then I would ask um, Allison Wood to uh, comment on the 2021 regional plan. Hi, thank you, Dave. Um, so I just also wanted to briefly mention that we're um, in the planning department working closely with Dave and his team to also develop our land use scenario for the sustainable community strategy in the 2021 regional plan. And um, 
so we're developing this scenario, this scenario to really reduce GHG emissions. It'll help us meet our SB 375 targets, um, complement the five big moves and the transportation network that is being developed. Um, and we're looking at a, a focus on mobility hubs in this scenario. So once the 2021 regional plan is, is completed, we'll have both the kind of series 14 baseline regional growth forecast, as well as this SCS land use scenario. So similar to um, those of you that have been involved in the past when we had sort of a baseline forecast and then a smart growth forca forecast, um, smart growth focused forecast, for example, we'll have two of those going forward. So this is another effort that's underway. And I think that um, concludes the presentation. So we can hand it back to the chair for discussion. All right, well, thank you, uh, David and Allison for that uh, Department of Finance uh, presentation. The uh, Before I move on to member comments, uh, I'd like to call on the clerk of the board. Did we receive any public comments on this item? Uh, clerk of the board, are you there? Okay, not hearing any. I'm going to go ahead and just uh, uh, push it out here to uh, ask if we've got any uh, comments from our our Twig members at this point. And just as a reminder, I need you to raise your hand uh, virtually so that I can call on you. This is Colleen, and I just wondered, Karen, if I could just provide a little bit more context here around this land use scenario. This is something we really want to talk with all of you about very soon. So hopefully at your next meeting, we can lay out what we're thinking about for the land use scenario that will actually go into the regional plan. And so this is something different than we've done before. And I think we've shared this with you previously and other MPOs, our partners throughout the state do this where you kind of lay out a desired land use pattern, not too different from when we had the smart growth concept map. And we would ask all of you as you update your general plans or as you update your community plans, use that concept map and as a basis, as a, you know, use that to sort of guide your work. We can always go back and modify it and change it. But one of the things that we are going to be looking at is if we're really making significant transit investments, what level of development is needed to support that and how do we bring those two together in a way that meets our statewide greenhouse gas target. So um, the piece that Allison just shared with you, we do want to bring that back in more detail for discussion with all of you soon. So thank you. My apologies, Chair. Um, there are no public comments on this item. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, with that said, uh, thank you, Colleen, uh, as well as uh, the clerk here. I've got a request to speak uh, from a few of you. So let's go uh, in the order that I saw the hands go up and let's go with uh, Felix uh, uh, Aponte Gonzalez. Not sure if there's a uh, microphone issue with, with Felix or not. Uh, Hello. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. Felix Aponte Gonzalez from the County of San Diego. Um, I was wondering if, given the current situation that we have with the public health emergency that we're facing right now, are there any projected changes in the timeline for revision? of this uh, population estimates? If I could have uh, perhaps David or Allison uh, weigh in on that uh, response, please. Yes, this is David. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, we we haven't, uh, I, I believe the question is, was um, any, any dates, um, being moved uh, for you know due dates, if you will, for for the regional plan and 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 so and and the forecast 
and uh, up to this point in time, the, there there have not been any changes in any of our um, uh, dates. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, let's go ahead and move to Michael Cohn from uh, City of Santee. Hi, uh, my question actually relates to the Comprehensive Multimodal Corridor Plan. And um, Mr. Chavez, he mentioned that the uh, the steering group would be would be comprised of two members from the twig. And I know that with the um, the high speed transit proposed for SR 52 and 67, and SR 52 of course is a hot button topic in Santee, and we've dedicated a lot of resources to that. So I just want to make um, see like what your thoughts are about selecting those two uh, members from our technical working group. Uh, yeah, Michael, I appreciate the the question. Um, we can circle back on that under member member comments at this point. Uh, just taking comments on this particular agenda item. Yeah, because there wasn't a uh, overall there wasn't a. a it, it wasn't agendized as an action uh, requiring any action by the twig. It was only a discussion item. Uh, at this point, we'll probably circle back uh, at a later date to get those nominations, but I'll have Seth speak to that somewhat uh, more as we move on to the, uh, the agenda item under uh, member comments. Do I have any other uh, comments on uh, this particular uh, agenda item? Okay, not seeing any other hands go up at this point. So I uh, really appreciate uh, the presentation by uh, David and Allison and uh, getting an update on uh, those uh, critical adjustments that are ongoing with the Department of Finance uh, uh, estimates. And with that, uh, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to, uh, as I mentioned, <laughs> agenda item number six, which is the member comments. Um, but before I kick it over to, uh, to, to Seth or the TWIG uh, groups. Uh, typically, as I'm sitting side by side uh, around the room, I have an opportunity to nudge uh, my vice chair, uh, Tony Shute, uh, to see if he's got any uh, comments or, or anything to uh, provide uh, for the greater good. Uh, I do see that he's online with us and uh, would like to, uh, to uh, ask the uh, folks to go ahead and uh, get him uh, activated to, to provide any comments. Tony, you're up. All right, thank you, Karen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. You know, no, I, um, as you, I share the appreciation of everybody um, working in this current environment, and we share the same struggles, I think, that you all share in trying to deliver service and keep the doors open. I'm putting quotes up, keep the doors open, uh, delivering uh, what we can deliver in the best manner that we can. We, you know, El Cajon, like all the other cities, are, um, you know, planning ahead and trying to deal with, uh, looking to deal with what the e economic implications are going to be and still be able to deliver services. So I certainly share with you all in, in that um, challenge. Um, I, I'm sure we're not alone. I'm sure every city in the state, if not the country or the world, is going to be dealing with the same thing. Um, but with that said, um, you know, kudos to Sandag staff and Karen, you're doing a fantastic job with this go-to meeting approach. Maybe you should be doing all your meetings this way. I appreciate that, Tony. Uh, again, my kudos to uh, to the Sandag staff to make this uh, a seamless process. So I uh, appreciate you uh, uh, chiming in here. So with that, let's uh, let me go ahead and open it up to any of the other Twig members. Um, see if I can get any hands raised as far as. Uh, any comments that uh, you'd like to offer other than what we've already been uh, talking about on the agenda? I'll give it a few seconds here as I, I look at my screen, as I normally uh, would be just circling around the table looking for a, a hand to go up. So seeing none, um, let me go ahead and uh, move on to agenda item number seven, uh, which is- uh, James, Robert Berry has his hand up. Oh, oh thank you very much. Uh, Appreciate that prompt. Looks like I do have a hand up from Robert Berry from LAFCO. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. 
Uh, LAFCO's offices, uh, of course, are closed under the emergency like everybody else, and we're working from home and making the best of it. Um, we do have a commission meeting on May 4th, uh, and we're trying to work out the bugs ahead of the meeting. Um, learning a lot from this meeting, as well as a lot of the other local governments, uh, the different formats that people are using, uh, and how well the platforms work with public comment. I think everybody is pretty concerned about, you know, trying to make it uh, as reasonable as possible for people to have a meaningful way to uh, provide input in the public hearings, especially. Uh, we'll be going into budget discussions. So, of course, you know, people are going to want to talk. Plus, we have some uh, major proposals uh, with the County Water Authority and Albrook Public Utility District and Rainbow Municipal Water District that will be quite interesting. And uh, I'm sure the public will want to weigh in. Um, the only other thing I wanted to say was that uh, in the process of updating general plans, please keep in mind the spheres of influence. We are going through our five-year process of reviewing all the spheres for the cities and districts. Uh, at LAFCO, it, we really rely on the local governments, especially with the general plan updates, to kind of keep in mind any areas with a sphere that they want to address uh, in terms of expansions or contractions to sync up with current planning processes. Most of the city spheres that were adopted 30, 35 years ago. So obviously with the growth and bringing them up to speed in, in this century, uh, it's important for us to be in sync with the local governments uh, and the city's general plan updates. So um, I'm available if anybody has any questions uh, and we will be uh, keeping involved through the twig to um, be appraised of what's going on with the cities. Uh, so uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Robert, I appreciate that. Uh, just overall reminder here is, is uh, some of us who are going through our general plan uh, updates uh, to make sure that we uh, keep the sphere of influence uh, boundary areas in mind as we uh, go ahead and move forward on that. So uh, uh, with that, uh-oh, uh screen just went dark. Oh, wow. So my screen just uh, went dark. I'm going to, uh, as I try to, work through that technical difficulty. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, thank you. So uh, again, I'm going to uh, kick it into agenda item number seven for uh, the TWIG members. Um, if there is any request here uh, to provide comments from our uh, TWIG members on this particular agenda item. And I'm going to, uh, my screen went dark, so I'm going to need to defer to Sandag staff as far as uh, helping me out if there's a hand raised. No hands raised here. Okay, thank you. Okay, Escondido and then. Mike raised his hand. Uh, City of Escondido, Mike, if you could uh, go ahead and, and uh, provide your. Yes, thank you. Um, for future meeting topics, I'd like to continue having a recurring. Um, item devoted to how cities are kind of coping uh, through different issues and the one i think that's probably most relevant is you know what are the economic development initiatives the innovative ways to kind of catalyze uh, new development activities or streamline uh, housing uh, development opportunities um, we're starting to create some pretty interesting concepts in escondido but it'd be good to have a kind of full spectrum of roundtable discussion about what other cities are doing. Thanks. All right. Appreciate that, Mike. I think that's a, a great idea. Uh, this is going to be an ongoing uh, ongoing item here. So I'm not really seeing any other hands up. I got my screen back. Uh, it's a little bit constrained, but uh, just wanted to verify with the Sandag staff that I'm not missing any hands up. No further hands. OK. Yes. Just Colleen has one comment before we wrap up. All right, Colleen, you're up. Well, Karen, you've done a really nice job thanking Sandag staff. And I think most of you, when you think of Sandag staff, you think of Seth or Allison or me or our fabulous intern. But I, I got to give a huge shout out to our IT team and the director of our IT program, James, who's behind the scenes making this all work, our IT team went into absolute, um, I don't know what you call it, overdrive, getting all of us set up. So 
that's who I really want to thank. And in as you're thanking the team for making this all work, it's really the Sandag IT team. So sending out my thanks and thank you everyone for being part of the meeting today. Really appreciate it. Good to hear your voices. Thank you, Colleen. I appreciate that. Uh, so before I adjourn the meeting, uh, again, uh, there's been many thanks here uh, throughout throughout the meeting on the technical side. Um, I'd like to say that it was fairly seamless uh, from a chair's perspective, uh, with the exception of just about a minute ago when my screen went uh, completely dark. <laughs> so that uh, I was glad to be able to navigate through on that, but really uh, certainly share uh, the opinions of, of Colleen, um, all of the all of the staff um, behind the, behind the scenes, so to speak, the IT. Uh, Tessa, the clerk of the board, uh, Seth, uh, been very helpful as I've uh, learned uh, some new technical skills, and it's it's been a, a, a pretty cool process from my perspective. So uh, certainly appreciate all of that. Um, before I talk about our next meeting on May 14th at uh, 1:15, um, I Seven. wanted to ask. I'm sorry, it's Tessa. Um, I just wanted to clarify on on item number three, the agenda specifically did not mention that you would be taking any action to appoint any members to a steering committee so you will need to take that at another meeting uh, yes thank you uh, certainly appreciate that tessa and um, as we've talked about um, we will uh, need to agendize that at a future meeting and perhaps that uh, can go on the the may uh, agenda item and i also just wanted to ask seth uh, of any other agenda topics that uh, we might be considering uh, on May 14th. Thank you, Chair. Um, we are putting together a panel for uh, to talk about SB 743 and VMT reduction. Um, we'll also potentially have the item that Colleen mentioned about the land use scenario for the uh, for the sustainable uh, community strategy. Uh, and yes, we will bring back the uh, appointment of the members to uh the uh, cmcp uh working group um we wanted to make sure we gave you some information on what the group was what it was doing um before uh we brought forward uh an item to actually appoint so you can you can take a look at the uh at the at the program itself uh, and decide next month if you'd uh, like to volunteer to be the twig representative and then also next month we'll be working on voting. So um, we wanted to make sure we gave everyone uh, this an opportunity to get used to the go to meeting format. Um, but next month we'll have to take some votes on a few things. So uh, be prepared for that. Okay, thank you, Seth. I, I appreciate that. And uh, given that uh, we're at, according to my clock, 337, uh, clearly we've gone over our, our typical adjournment time of 315. So we'll uh, be a little bit more mindful of that uh, next go around. And, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get through the meeting uh, in our standard allotted time. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to again say thank you to everybody for uh, what seemed to be a fairly seamless uh, meeting here and working through those little minor glitches that we did encounter. So with that, we're adjourned. Be well. Thank you very much. <laughs>